Hey everybody and welcome to Bible class. John chapter 3 is where my Bible is open. I want to start reading with you there in just a moment. We're wrapping up our little four-part series of what is baptism. And throughout this month, we've learned that baptism is a funeral. Baptism is a birth. Baptism is an adoption. Today, I want to bring it all to a close by trying to show you that baptism is a wedding. Now, that might not immediately be clear until we start listening in our New Testament to passages like John chapter 3. Is your Bible open there? Let's listen in, beginning in verse 25, where John tells us that there was a discussion that arose between some of John's disciples, John the Baptist, and a Jew over purification and They came to John, John the Baptist, and they said to him, Rabbi, teacher, he who was with you across the Jordan, they're talking about Jesus, he he to whom you bore witness. Do you remember what John said in John chapter 1, verse 29? He pointed at Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They say, Look, you started over there. Jesus was with you. In fact, you're the one who baptized Jesus. Look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. Listen to John's answer. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And then of all the ways he could describe the work of the Christ, listen to what he says. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. John is describing himself as a a friend of the bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom in, in John's illustration? That's Jesus. Jesus is the one with the bride. Now, how do I come to be a part of the bride of Christ? Can you turn a few pages later in your New Testaments to the book of Romans? Romans chapter 6. We've referenced this briefly throughout our study. But Romans chapter 6, the first few verses are a great explanation of what is happening in baptism. We know there are lots of examples of people being baptized in the New Testament. But what is God doing? When we do that, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul asks, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin, baptism is a funeral, still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is a birth. For if we have been united, united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him 
in a resurrection like his. Now, there are lots of ways to think about what Paul is describing, but this idea of being united with Christ, that's that's the language of a covenant. And in other parts of our building block studies, we've talked about what covenants are. Covenants are relationships based on promises. In fact, that's how the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 describes this being united. How are we united with Christ in baptism. Well, to the Corinthians, he said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you. I I promised you. You were promised as belonging to one husband. Who is that husband? Is Jesus Christ. In fact, if you'll go with me to the very last book of the Bible, this is really the note that the Bible begins to to end on in Revelation chapter 19. John sees all sorts of incredible things in the, the Revelation vision. I want you to listen carefully to the language, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6, where John says, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. They were crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. There's, There's reason for joy. Why? The marriage of the Lamb has come. Remember, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the bridegroom. How do I come to be a part of his bride? Well, here it is. The marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. How does the bride of Jesus make herself ready? It was granted her to clothe herself. All month long, we've been hearing baptism being compared to clothing ourselves with, putting on Christ. Here, it was granted the bride of Jesus to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the the saints. How does someone come to be a saint? How, How does someone come to have clean, pure, bright garments? Back in Revelation chapter 7, we hear that their robes our robes, the the spiritual garments of disciples of Jesus Christ are cleansed, they're, they're purified, they're made white in the blood of the Lamb. And now in Revelation 19 verse 9, God says, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God. What have we learned all month long? Well, baptism is a funeral. What do you mean by that? It's recognizing my greatest problem is sin. I'm turning away from sin. I want to be done with sin. Baptism is a birth. God is willing and able to turn my life around. But he doesn't just send me on my way. No, baptism is 
an adoption. By God's grace, I can be God's child. And baptism is a wedding. For the rest of my life, I belong to God. Boy, do we have a lot to talk about. I hope this study has helped you. Maybe even prompted some questions in your mind that now you can talk with your in-person class teacher about. Thank you so much for building with me this month. I hope you have a great rest of this evening and a great rest of this week. Thank you.